This past May, I had the opportunity to go to Anime Central 2019 as press, and attend a behind-the-scenes panel and interview session with several of the principal staff behind Shoujo Kageki Revue Starlight. Director Tomohiro Furukawa, character designer Hiroyuki Saita, animator Takushi Koide, and prop designer Shiori Tani. Revue Starlight balances an expansive theatrical narrative with an ensemble cast to remarkably efficient effect. With nine girls, and in most cases only one focus episode to explore their individual conflicts, the task facing the staff was immense. How to instill life into each of its characters, more than simply props on the stage of its story. Made more difficult by virtue of being an anime original. While Revue Starlight has since developed into another of Bushiroad's massive multimedia projects from its live-action stage play to a popular mobile game, the production team at Kinema Citrus had no source material to work with. Instead, they had to rely on their own process to lend depth to each of Seisho Academy's brightest stars. While providing insight into each of their roles on the production, the staff shed light on the thought put into every creative decision to best maximize the audience's engagement with its otherwise eclectic story. As they walked through their creative process in crafting the characters and aspects of the world, what struck me was just how much consideration they put into each and every detail, from the slightest features of the designs to the most subtle interactions with the space. According to Furukawa and Saita, creating the character designs proved especially difficult with no source to draw upon. Because it was so early in production, Furukawa hardly had any story details to offer Saita. The only things he had to go off of were the names, the number of characters, and a little about their personalities. To which Furukawa said, I'm very sorry, noting how difficult a project it was. Saita recalls Furukawa telling him, just anything, just come up with anything, which he says made it even harder. The two met once or twice a week to talk about the style they envisioned and how to implement it. They were supposed to come up with stuff on the fly during these meetings, but Saita says he doesn't like drawing in front of others, making this approach a bit unproductive. After a couple months with middling results, Saita decided to instead come up with and secretly draw the characters at home where he could work on his own before bringing them in. There, they had a breakthrough. Rather than figuring them out one at a time, Saita thought it might craft better balance to come up with them all together. So he drew them all in one page, noting their height differences and aesthetics. A sheet looking something like this. Furukawa said he was extremely impressed with the quality of the art and detail that was put into it. For the Seisho uniforms, Saita took a lot of inspiration from the Takarazuka Music School. From the gray palette to the white undershirt, and most notably, the red bows. According to Saita, the staff didn't want them to be too dull, because it's for the theater. They should be extravagant and decorated. But Saita pushed back, citing the Takarazuka-inspired look as his vision. The compromise was enlarging the bows. Given the series' other visual and thematic connections to the famous musical troupe, the decision worked wonderfully. Each of the characters' designs captures some aspect of their personality, while remaining visually distinct. They placed huge emphasis on their silhouettes and hairstyles, ensuring you could tell each of the characters apart just by their outline, and giving them their own flavor. For instance, with Cotton, they focused on her Genki girl aspect, wanting her shape and look to represent that as well as in her expressions. There was a lot of back and forth when first creating her character to find that. Saita came up with her hairstyle, noting the hair ornaments were originally going to be used for Juna, but Furukawa switched it to Cotton instead. In the end, I think they nailed it. The twin tails scream Genki. In contrast, they wanted Hikari to represent the opposite of Cotton, so they went with a slim and slender look, more toned down energetically. Hikari's design and expression are less bubbly, her hair flat. Most interestingly, Saita says he added a slight hue of blue value to her skin, to literally give her that cooler aura. Since the word hikari means shine, they decided to make her hair shiny, with her star ornament modeled after the Subaru logo. Similar to hikari, Maya was also supposed to be cool, calm, and collected originally. She exudes a well-put-together energy as Seisho's top star, confident but not arrogant. So Saita decided to make her more boisterous instead, a natural beauty. Furukawa agreed, and they added a big ribbon in there because, quote, anime should have ribbons. Each of the characters went through a similar process of trial and error to capture the correct feel, with one exception, Nana. Saita says he spent little time on Nana's design, his first drafts feeling right from the start. They knew immediately she would be the tallest, hinting at her hidden strength. Her most striking feature was also pretty straightforward. She goes by banana, so what if we make her hair look like bananas? Genius, Furukawa said. That playful attitude from the staff and coming up with their vision really allowed the project to shine. 
the character designs themselves were only one piece to the puzzle of bringing these stage girls to life. Equally important to their personalities was the prop design, led by Shiori Tani. It was her role to add the various objects, clothes, and images the characters sport. It's one of the most critical and possibly overlooked aspects of character creation. Each item presents an opportunity to tell us something about that character. As much as their hairstyle or aesthetic, we can read a lot into the stuff they surround themselves with. The thought you can tell Tani put into every one of these decisions is extraordinary, even going through a number of variations for Kaden's phone case. Her incredible fashion sense shows through too, as she handled the character's clothing line outside of the school, including their winter look found in the game, Relive. Just like Saita, she also didn't have much story to go off of, so she created a collage of reference images for each character to pull from. She says she based these image boards around a word or feeling she felt captured the spirit of the character. Kaden's key word was, of course, Genki. She filled it with active, strong stuff, like biking. Hikari was cool and mysterious. Hers had lots of blues. Juna was natural. Tani thought of Muji, a Japanese retail company specializing in household goods, sporting minimalist design and a no-brand policy, meaning little is spent on advertising or marketing. That straightforward approach fits Juna perfectly. Nana was retro. Her images had lots of pastels and feelings of nostalgia, a hint at her connection to the past. Mahiru proved difficult for Tani, as she says she doesn't know anyone similar to her, so had to work harder to figure out how to fill in her character. Eventually, the mascot character, coupled to Mahiru's actress Haruki Iwata's love of baseball, formed her basis. Futaba's boyish aspect was also tough, so her key word was China, even though Tani says you can't really see it in the character currently. That said, the curtain hanging over the door opening in her dorm room still carries that aspect. Kaoruko, meanwhile, was modern girl, mixed with a refined air of nostalgia while still current. Claudine was simply France, and lastly, when we got to top star Maya, Tani immediately said Beijing, gorgeous, adding she thought classical. Much of the character's personality is inherent to their look, but how to convey this through the animation itself? Revue Starlight excels at the principle of show, don't tell. I've already covered how the auditions visually convey the conflict of the fights through their staging extensively, but it isn't just this most explosive area where Starlight nails the concept of visual storytelling. Even throughout its more subdued, slice-of-life scenes, the subtle interactions between the characters inform so much of their personhood, often without uttering a word. As an example of this, Furukawa walked through their introduction from episode 1, highlighting how there's a lot more going on here than simply what's said. The scene establishes the core dynamics between the cast and the conflict at the heart of it, not by telling us, but showing us. It begins on position 0, starting out at the middle line, already centering our focus around it. Next, we shift to Kaden's entry. Furukawa said they kept her isolated here to first establish her determination in reaching position 0, before bringing in the other characters to emphasize the distance separating her from it. Kaden arriving first puts her the furthest away from position 0 by the end of the scene as the others all insert themselves into the scene between her. As each girl enters, they announce themselves to the stage. We catch a glimpse of their personalities based on the way they carry themselves here. Furukawa said this wasn't just a way to introduce them to the viewer, it also felt fitting for their theatrical nature. Where the scene shuffles Kata into the bottom, it emphasizes Maya's place at the top. Her entry is the turning point, replacing the playful mood with one of fierce focus. As the others look on from the sidelines, the scene closes on Maya at the center. Position Zero belongs to her. The scene illustrates the staff's dedication to establishing the relationships of the characters through visuals as much as anything. Rather than using dialogue to show this power struggle, they used movement, positioning, and the drawings to convey it organically. Episode 1 is filled with moments like this. The practice montage highlights the specialties of the various characters, how each of them has something they excel at that matches their nature. Futaba's sword fighting or Nana's support, for instance in addition to establishing Seisho as a vocational academy different from a typical school. During Kaden's conversation with Mahiru and Nana, we see an intense battle between Maya and Claudine, turning even the most innocuous actions into a competition. Claudine fittingly jumps the gun and scrambles to follow Maya's movement, matching her. One of my favorite examples of this storytelling is the saga of Kaoruko versus the Scallion. In episode 1, we see her look of disgust, before shuffling her scallions over to Futaba's plate. Now skip to episode 6 in the middle of their fight. As Kaoruko attempts to prove she can be independent, here she sucks it up and forces herself to choke them down. Finally, in the last episode, this duel comes to an end, with Kaoruko stubbornly proclaiming her hatred of scallions and Futaba telling her to get over it. 
Those incidental moments go a long way towards building out the characters without hardly calling attention to it. All that focus makes Revue Starlight's cast feel like living people who exist offstage as much as they do on it. For a series as larger than life as Starlight can be at times, the grounded nature of its characters is crucial in giving the audience an entry point, a way they can relate it back to them. They focused on lending a sense of reality to its most out there elements as well. Furukawa says he wanted to do something different from the traditional magical girl transformation. No sparkles or outfits appearing out of nowhere. Rather, he wanted to show machinery physically making the costumes, sets, etc. as produced for the stage. He cites his love of Discovery Channel as a kid who's always been fascinated by those making of documentaries, hoping to capture this mechanical build while giving the machinery a rhythmic aspect to match the musicality of the sequence too. All in all, it grounds the transformation with a tactile feel. Furukawa also notes they went with Tokyo Tower and the Giraffe for similar reasons. Familiar images viewers could latch onto, bringing the otherworldly some semblance of reality. Because, of course, a talking alien would be much more foreign to the audience than a talking giraffe. For that same purpose, they gave the giraffe a familiar phrase, Wakarimasu. Furukawa believes the interactive element between the work and the audience is crucial for an original series with no established fanbase. So he thought of ways they could drive social media engagement, believing a catchphrase like that would be an easily replicable connection between viewer and work. Given the high volume of fun and memes it sparked, I'd say it was a stroke of genius. The ASEN badge lanyard literally sported the phrase on the back. That level of foresight is indicative of a director who understands how to craft an experience. Revue Starlight is an extraordinarily ambitious project. The production went through numerous difficulties between an insanely tight schedule and limited resources to draw from. Interestingly, three of the four guests say they didn't originally decide to enter animation until they were young adults. Furukawa studied history at university, while Koide majored in economics. The only one who knew early on was Tani, who says her greatest challenge was having difficulty deciding what ramen she'd eat that day. She's a genius, Furukawa assures us. Because of its strained production, ambitious ideas, and original status, Revue Starlight needed that efficiency in its storytelling to function, using every aspect possible to convey meaning. The result is an incredibly layered work, somehow managing to balance epic duels, musical numbers, and a talking giraffe, with a cast of nine bursting with unique personalities. Hearing the staff walk through their creative process was a privilege. You can really tell how much care went into building every aspect of the series. As I look it over and see how Revue Starlight's many pieces came together, I can only think, Wakarimas. Asen was a terrific experience, and I was so thrilled to see all the attention given to one of my very favorite series in Starlight. I certainly plan to attend next year as well. I'd like to mention I'll also be at Anime Expo this coming week. For anyone who'd like to see me or Nice, follow us on Twitter at JackUTS and MrNiceGuy, as we'll be posting updates every now and then. Hopefully, we'll see you there. <laughs>